was 12. Thomas gave a TED talk, <laughs> let me say that again, <laughs> uh, and he w impressed me so much online that I sought out his uh, parents to see if we could invite him to Gravity Summit. Thomas has been in big demand since this TED talk, and if you get a chance, search on Thomas Suarez TED and take a look at the talk. It's, it's absolutely exhilarating in terms of what the future looks like. In our book, uh, Terry and I talk about uh, digital natives, meaning people who grow up in this digital world, and Thomas certainly is one of these people. So, after a couple of conversations with Thomas's dad and mom, um, we were able to uh, work it out that Thomas could come up and share with us here today. He has been invited all around the world to speak, and he's in school, and he has a normal life, and most of, the, uh, most of his invitations he does not accept, he can't accept. But he came here because he would love to maybe go to UCLA one day, and you will be so impressed, I know it's not wonderful today, you will be so impressed with Thomas, and you will be very impressed with the topics that he has chosen to talk about. Uh, most of the people in this audience are aware of SOPA and PIPA as big, big deals. This is the Privacy Act about the Internet, uh, for those of you who don't know. Thomas is going to speak to us about that today and some other thoughts that I know he has because he's just absolutely fabulous. And without further ado, let me introduce to you Thomas Suarez. Thomas Suarez. Um, I've always been fascinated by technology. And when Apple came out with the iPhone and the concept of the App Store, I thought it'd be cool to create an app uh, or program an app. So I found out how to do it, and I have a few apps available on the App Store now. The first one was very simple. It was like a, uh, it's called Earth Fortune. It's a fortune teller. And my favorite and most amusing one is Bustin Jeeber. <laughs> which is an anti-Justin Bieber app. <laughs> where you get to hit Justin Bieber in the face. <laughs> it's great fun. It's kind of like a whack-a-mole game, so it bounces around the place. So I'm now working on apps for a uh, sport for my local sports league and for a major entertainment event. Last October, I spoke at a learning conference at TEDx Manhattan Beach about ways to share technology knowledge with other students through an app club, and most of pretty much teaching them how to program. Now, at the App Club, we discuss all kinds of technology trends. And what I think, something I think is interesting is how manufacturers are using the term smart, whether it be in smartphones or smart TVs. They call them smart. In a phone's case, a smartphone means a phone that you can, not, not just a phone, but you can receive email on it, you can go on the internet on it, and you can download fun and useful apps. And more recently, smart TVs have come along. They're very similar to the smartphone in that you can download apps and you can go on the internet and you can go on YouTube and stuff. However, I challenge their use of the term smart because I don't really think that th these devices should be called smart. The new iPhone has Siri, and I, think, I believe that's a step in the right direction. I assume everybody here knows what Siri is on the new iPhone? Yes. yes. It's a virtual, if you like to think of it this way, it's a virtual person who lives inside your phone. <laughs> no, no. It's not creepy. I, I don't think it's creepy. It's virtual, so it's fine. It attempts to answer questions you ask it. So let's say you ask it about the weather or uh, should I should I wear a raincoat today or an umbrella? And it can understand you, and it knows 
and it can well, basically it understands you and it can give you useful results. But I really believe that smart, sure Siri is a step in the right direction, but Siri doesn't know you as a person. Siri doesn't know who you are. Siri doesn't know what your personality is. Siri doesn't know what your emotions are, what you like, what you don't like. It doesn't know that. So it can't really make assumptions about a lot of things. So let's say you get home after a long day at work, and you're frustrated, and you start watching TV. Well, smart TV. It senses you're in a bad mood, so it can turn itself off so it doesn't get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. But seriously, it could play the appropriate music, or it could get, say you want to have a video chat with your mom or whoever. Whatever it knows you like when you're in a bad mood. So it knows your interactions and relationships with other people this way. Another idea I had is think how cool it would be if you were, you were watching TV or you were watching a movie and you were able to say to your TV, ah, I can't remember who the actor is. Uh, what, is his, what is his name and what, what movie have I seen him in before? And the TV, or the smartphone, TV, the smart TV, could pop up like a little window in the corner of your screen and show you useful results. And that way it learns what actors you like seeing in movies and, and stuff like that. Or what, what, uh, what college team did that football player play for? I, I can't remember or I don't know. And again, it could show game statistics and basically what, what college team did you play for. Another topic that's been generating a lot of amount, a lot of interest throughout the internet community, and I've been talking with, with been talking with my friends about it, on the SOPA and PIPA, or the SOPA and PIPA bills that, call, that the government's trying to pass. The internet has always been in the U.S. The internet has always been a, a, an open, unrestricted resource to everybody for information. You know, you can go on Google, you can go on Wikipedia, you can find out pretty much anything. However, these government bills are trying to stop internet piracy. And they do have some pros and cons. I can understand that the entertainment industry doesn't want stealing. They don't want people to steal their copyrighted material. I wouldn't want someone stealing my app. I wouldn't want someone stealing my copyrighted works. So that's, that's all I mean, but there is a huge concern throughout the internet community that is this just step one of internet censorship in the US? Is this the tip of the iceberg? Will access be limited in the future? <coughs> As a result of all these questions, there's been extreme unease amongst the internet community. Possibly paranoia? All of this prompted a blackout on January 18th. Wikipedia, Google, and many other sites blocked out most of their pages on their site to show kind of what it might be like if these bills are passed. Now, I've spoken to many of my friends about this. And the kids in school, they want a free and open internet. It's what they grew up with. It's what I grew up with. And they can't comprehend why anyone would want to restrict the internet. A lot don't even understand what the bills mean. I also noticed that everybody at my school, they get their music from iTunes, their online books from Amazon, and their movies from Netflix. We all realize that if you don't pay for a hamburger <coughs> at a restaurant, what's going to happen? If you don't pay for your stuff at a restaurant, it's gonna happen. Like any business. The business is gonna go, is just gonna go bankrupt. Right? If you don't pay for your music or you don't pay for your movies, it might not be available anymore on the internet. So I like to finish up by commenting that I'm 
part of a generation that is fortunate enough to be growing up in these exciting technological times. It's great to be at the conference today. Thank you. Math and learn from the stuff that you are missing. Create your own path with your own vision.